1992, the face of the NWA, Nature Boy Ric Flair, had jumped ship to the WWF and won what is considered by many to be the greatest Royal Rumble match in history, and in doing so became the WWF champion. The stage seemed set for the collision of worlds that wrestling fans had dreamed of for almost a decade, Ric Flair vs Hulk Hogan. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the 2004 Ric Flair autobiography To Be The Man by Flair and Keith Elliott Greenberg. Specifically, we'll look at a passage where Flair recollects WrestleMania 8, the event that would have seen Flair wrestle Hogan, but instead saw Flair lose the WWF Championship to Randy Macho Man Savage. So exactly how did Flair feel about his WrestleMania bout with Savage? Let's find out, and I'll share my thoughts with you at the end. After the Royal Rumble, the plan had been for me to wrestle Hogan in a setting the match deserved, WrestleMania 8 on April 5th, 1992, at the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis. The original storyline would involve me losing to Hogan and giving him the title back, but Vince's relationship with Hogan had deteriorated by then, and Hogan was aspiring to become a full-time actor, so the WrestleMania 8 lineup was switched around. Hogan would wrestle Sid, then take a long sabbatical. I was booked against Randy Macho Man Savage. Vince's strategy at this point was to leave the title on me, but Randy whined and moaned until the decision was changed. I had no qualms either way. Having known Randy from when we worked together in Charlotte in the 1970s, I admired his intensity in the ring, and I had wanted to wrestle him since his first championship run in 1988. What I didn't know was that Randy was a very insecure guy. He wanted me to come to his home in Florida and practice the match. Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning was also there because he was going to interfere on my behalf. I'd never done anything like this in my life. I found out the same thing had happened in 1987 when Randy defended the Intercontinental Championship against Ricky Steamboat at WrestleMania 3. Randy drove Ricky insane going over each move again and again. When people praised the match as the greatest in World Wrestling Federation history, Steamboat would kind of shrug. He shared my belief that the best matches are called in the ring and on the fly, not laid out on paper. Make no mistake about it, I respect Randy Savage for his skills and accomplishments, but because of his unwillingness to just get in the ring and improvise, I won't call him a great worker. In Florida, I realised that there was real tension between Randy and his manager Elizabeth. Elizabeth and Randy were married in real life, and for reasons I'll never understand. The only good thing about the situation was that it also became part of their act. Randy came off as a nervous, somewhat crazy guy. Even in the middle of a match, he seemed to be keeping an eye on Elizabeth. Unlike other female managers and valets, Elizabeth always seemed a little vulnerable when she was at ringside, so it made sense that officials would ban her from the dressing room, or to the dressing room, at WrestleMania 8, out of fear for her safety. With Elizabeth unable to object, my executive consultant, Mr. Perfect, and I could double-team Randy with impunity in the early part of the match. When Randy made his comeback, I wanted emotion. And he asked me if I could bleed. I agreed even though at the time Vince was still marketing his company as family entertainment and had forbidden any bleeding. To counter my predicament, Henning tossed me a foreign object, prompting Elizabeth to scurry out from the dressing room while a bunch of anonymous suits tried to stop her, including a young Shane McMahon. Inside the ring, I worked over Randy's leg, taunting Elizabeth with, It's for you, baby, before inflicting more damage. As I snatched at his limb and prepared to pummel it again, Savage blocked the move and delivered a punch, rolled me over, held my trunks, and won the title. Nonetheless, Randy appeared barely able to walk, facilitating a situation where I could terrorise Elizabeth. With blood staining my blonde mane, I trudged over to her and whispered, Liz, come here. Then I grabbed her and kissed her on the lips. Now slap me, I said. She pulled back, and with a look of revulsion on her face, hauled off on me. Pained by his inability to protect the woman he loved, Randy leaped on me and we rolled around on the mat, throwing punches while officials tried to wedge between us. Despite Randy's legitimate jealousy and my reputation as a womanizer, he was okay with the kiss. 
He knew me well enough to understand that I'd never hone in on his woman. When I got backstage, though, Vince was pissed about the blood. Just as you get this close to greatness, he scolded. You do something stupid like this and take two steps backwards. Okay, so let's talk about some of the takeaways. Firstly, I thought it was really interesting that Fleur chose not to go into great detail here about the Hogan match falling through. Because this is one of the biggest what-ifs in wrestling history. And there's surely more to the story that Fleur alludes to here and surely that more Fleur has to say about the matter. And it's certainly worth us looking at it in more detail in a future video. I was also really surprised at how forthright Fleur was here with his feelings towards Savage. Remembering that this book was released in 2004, which is well before Savage's passing, Fleur stating that he didn't consider Savage a great worker surely would have hurt the Macho Man. I've also always really found it interesting the dynamic that Savage and Elizabeth had. For all the talk of Savage's paranoia, the couple were clearly aware that the dynamic of their relationship was engaging for audiences. It's really interesting that Savage's insecurities played a part in the couple's separation, evidently, but he was also conscious enough to manipulate that aspect of their lives for the purpose of entertainment um, and for the audiences that they performed in front of. Finally, Flair also seems to suggest that he places some of the blame of a perceived ceiling on his success in the WWF at Savage's door. He recalls being scolded by Vince following the match, but essentially he says he was talked into bleeding by Savage. Was Flair right? Was this match one of the reasons that Flair ended up returning to WCW shortly after? I'd love to hear about your thoughts, so let me know what you thought um, about Ric Flair and how he saw his WrestleMania 8 match with Randy Savage in the comments below. If you got value from this video, then please consider helping the channel grow by hitting like and subscribe. And until next time, this has been One Full Theory, where we smarten up and smack down.